Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Good to see you, Daniel. Happy Monday, Dr. Paul. Good to see you here today, and we're going to talk about an explosive report. Yes. But, you know, my first reaction is, what's so explosive about this? <laughs> this is what we suspected. We just didn't have it down. But it now comes out that a lot of our suspicions, because it's so commonplace, and that's, you know, that's what empires do, and that is they occupy countries, they get involved in war, and we're talking about Ukraine. Uh, you know, uh, the U.S. position is, you know, we don't have troops on the ground. We're not there. We're neutral on this and all that other nonsense. And uh, yet now we have an authentic report, which uh, even made the New York Times that they, they're recognizing this CIA is actually in Ukraine. Yeah. Can you believe this? Uh, and uh, all I can say is there's a lot of hypocrisy going on. It's, it's more than it's worse than hypocrisy. It's flat out lying and deceit. And uh, of course, uh, we had a lot more troops in there. And they, when the uh, real serious fighting, you know, broke out, uh, a lot of the troops were brought home. But uh, now they're admitting it's being confirmed that uh, special forces and the CIA is there. But but Daniel. We've talked about this, uh, and I always make the assumption, and maybe it's an overstatement, that we have an empire to defend. We have 120 countries that we have to deal with. We have to deal with sanctions and and uh, and bonuses and selling weapons and all these things. So we probably, you know, years and years ago, I had a uh, relative that worked in an embassy, and this was before we knew about the conspiracy of the CIA, and it probably was, might have even been be before 1963. But he said that the businessman, he ran at, at embassies, he ran into more uh, CIA agents and business people at the same time oh, in the yeah. embassies. So this whole idea, this facade is one thing. But this is a good report, though. You know, it confirms uh, our strong suspicion that uh, we do occupy, but it also confirms the fact that our, our worries are justified because, uh, uh, you know, foreign countries don't put up this put up with this forever and besides our money doesn't last forever and it costs money and uh, it costs money on a, a moral uh, in a moral sense it costs money with dollars and deficits that we deal with it costs money in the value of our dollar all these things right now are a deep concern for the marketplace so uh, this is just an, another uh, bit of evidence that they're revealing uh, this information, I think it's interesting that people have a couple, couple ideas on exactly why, why are we getting this information right now? Yeah, it really is like reading Pravda in the old days in the Soviet Union. You read what the party reports and then you have to interpret and read between the lines and figure out what they're really trying to say and why they're trying to tell you this. And that's exactly what's happening with this report. On the surface, it's an admission, it's a scoop, it's a bombshell that the CIA is involved in Ukraine. As you say, wow, surprise me again, <laughs> will you? Uh, but they're directing how the Ukrainians are using the top level intelligence that the US intelligence community is feeding them, and also an unspecified number of commandos acting on the ground there. Who knows what exactly what they are doing? But the, the main important part, and this is where our friend Larry Johnson comes in because he has been involved in this for a long time. He did counter terrorism and counterintelligence with the CIA and the State Department. And he points out something very important about this New York Times article. And he says, and I'll quote him from his piece on Son of the American Revolution.com. He says, when you read some so-called bombshell report dishing out the dirt on some top secret U.S. operation in the New York Times or Washington Post, you need to understand that this was not the result of some intrepid, eager beaver reporter who took the initiative and came up with a nifty idea for a story. Such stories are based on official, sanctioned leaks, and they always have an ulterior motive. This is not so much about informing an ignorant public about reality. Rather, it is either propaganda or signaling a shift in U.S. policy. So I think that is important to keep that in mind when you look for context in the New York Times reporting. You know, um Government is out of control, and that's the big thing. And uh, 
it's well known uh, a period of time when I got very interested in in, in politics and economics and the monetary system. And it had to do with the significance and the tremendous influence a secret uh, group of men, some people call it the deep state, have absolute control, uh, monopoly control over a reserve currency of the world. And uh, because of the power of the United States, military and economic power, it, it, it lends itself to tremendous uh, political power. So that, that has been there. But uh, I started off uh, and continue that we ought to audit the Fed, uh, and when people know what the Fed is really doing, uh, the people are going to say, why do we have a Fed? But why, what about, this, what about the CIA? I, I, the CIA really doesn't get audited. I didn't have a chance to, you know, look at all their activities and where the money went. That was, that was all done in secrecy, and it continues to do it. I'm not even sure that most, uh, most people in Congress, I imagine it would be 12, 15 people probably are trustworthy for the deep state for yeah. them to know, know what's going on. So th they have a pretty good feel. So, uh, you know, it wasn't big news to us because we just understand how the system works, but it was not good big news to the people who share in this inf information. But, you know, there's uh, never never been a, uh, an audit, a total audit of the Pentagon either. No, no. It, it just think of the, uh, especially in this century, the Mideastern Wars, and it continues that way. And, it, and it, it's done by, you know, shenanigans through the Fed, but it's also done by just the old-fashioned way of, you know, filling up a railroad car of cash and shipping it over someplace, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, the, the people are able to uh, maintain their power that way. So it's, it's the secrecy in government, and I think there will always be secrecy in government, and that's the tough one. I think it's going to be much easier to argue the case for shrinking the size of government, you know, because there was a time when our government was, was much smaller. We didn't police, we, we weren't running an empire, and we had a dollar was backed by gold, and we didn't have a welfare state, and it was a little bit easier keeping tabs on it. Right? But that isn't it. And so I, uh, I see the problem for this time of runaway uh, foreign policy is as a result of, uh, you know, just big government that's hard to manage and, and the people are held in, in ignorance because the politicians either don't care or don't know, uh, have, they don't have the energy to look, really look into it. Look at all the stuff that went on with COVID. Get, get the information, then it turns around that it isn't so much that people don't ever look, but when people look for information, then they can get in trouble with the law. You know, all of a sudden, you know, the Justice Department is on you. So I information to me, I think, is what's lacking here. That's why these articles are good. <laughs> yeah, they're very, it's very good and very important, but maybe not even for the intended reasons. One of the great points that Larry Johnson makes are a couple things. First of all, according to this New York Times bombshell, the CIA is, quote, <clears throat> directing vast amounts of, tele of intelligence to the Ukrainian government and military. So the idea that they are giving them vast amounts of intelligence, that also means, Johnson points out, that they know the, what the Ukrainian government is doing with that intelligence. He demonstrates it very well in his article, uh, that they know very well what Ukraine is doing. And the interesting point that, that Johnson makes <clears throat> is this directly contradicts a recent New York Times report of just a couple of weeks ago saying, claiming that the U.S. has no idea what's going on inside the Ukrainian government. We have no idea how they're fighting this war, what they're doing. This is completely undermined by this new narrative that they're establishing, <coughs> excuse me, which is that we're giving them tons of intelligence, uh, tons of directions. Here's where uh, this troop movement is. Here's where you can take this out. Um, and he's pointing out that by passing this intelligence, you can see, again, how they use it. And the point that is being made here in the article is that Ukraine is not able to use it. For example, they could do nothing to save the 2,500 troops uh, that were captured of the Azov Battalion uh, in Azovstal, in the, in the plant there. So they're not, they're not able to use it. And what he concludes is very important, I think, too, and this is uh, in an article, he points out that the last couple of paragraphs of the New York Times article are the most important parts where they talk about the, um, 
The Ukrainian military's most acute training problem right now is that it's losing its most battle-hardened and well-trained forces, according to former U.S. officials. So the point is we're giving them the intel, the CIA is giving them the intel, and they realize now that they are not able to use it. This New York Times piece says having American trainers on the ground might not be worth the risks, other former officials said. Uh, would the enhancement of training be worth possible price if it's going to have to be paid? Mr. Wise said he's a government official. The answer is probably not. And so Johnson points out that this is signaling, and I'm paraphrasing, I think, what Johnson means here. We're there. We're doing our best. It isn't helping. It's time for a policy shift. Yeah, it, it's tough figuring it all out, but there's one healthy thing going on because the American people right now realize that it's tough getting the truth no matter uh, how hard they try and uh, it's finding the people that they can trust and uh, the uh, a new uh, Caitlin Caitlin Johnstone yeah. wrote, wrote something over this and I think it, in a way it's sort of funny but it's so true and exactly what you were talking about as she, she said the New York Times said the CIA has no idea what's happening on the ground in Ukraine well that's a, Pretty good statement uh, in, in the New York Times. But 17 days later, the New York Times reports Ukraine is full of CIAs. It makes, yeah. it makes your point, yeah, yeah. you know. I thought that was, a, that was pretty neat. But, you know, the, the, the other problem is we, we, we've lost confidence in our government, uh, and it's justifiable. And uh, the, the whole idea of uh, having journalists uh, 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 you know, around that might do some real research, that's essentially gone too. So we, we go to other people. Thank goodness that uh, there's still uh, enough room on the Internet for uh, programs like ours that tries to get information out, but also other people, good, you know, journalists that uh, we rely on, they get the information out there. But, boy, their challenge just is just think of the restraints on the very important issue of uh, natural immunity. Oh, that was a dangerous subject to bring up, and yet people were punished punished for that. So it's uh, it's the, the whole the whole thing. The, the most important thing is that we maintain the ability to get our information out, and uh, it, it's becoming more difficult. And uh, I guess the the one quote that I've used that I think is so neat is ideas are sort of pervasive, uh, as bad as it is, and as difficult as it is that the uh, that the enemy and the establishment and the deep state, they, they don't want anybody to know about it. Ideas seem to filter out there and they do spread. And that, of course, is, uh, should be the goal of anybody who cares about the country that we live in, spreading these ideas. And one of the things, again, in between the lines here, Dr. Paul, is in the article itself. And if we can skip to that third clip here, we've got ahead of ourselves here. But this is from the article. And this is why they're not capable of acting on the intelligence that they're being given. If you go back one, please. Sorry, I messed up. This is from the article. Former Trump administration official says, quote, they, Ukraine, are losing 100 soldiers today. That is almost like the height of the Vietnam War for us. It's terrible, a former Trump administration official said. And they're losing a lot of experienced people. So they're losing their most experienced people. And the New York Times says 100 soldiers a day. Why don't we take the president of Ukraine for his own word and use that next one, put that next one up, please, because Ukraine's own president is saying 60 to 100 soldiers are killed and 500 wounded daily. I've seen the defense minister said 500 to 1,000. So when you have, if 100 off the battlefield is like the height of Vietnam, you talk about them losing 500 troops from the battlefield, 100 killed and the other 400 if you get your leg blown off, you're not dead, but you're not going to go out fighting the next day. So you're seeing an absolute attrition of the forces uh, in Ukraine. They're not capable of using the intelligence that's being given. And what is the answer of, for NATO in the West? Well, more escalation, more troops, more weapons, more money to Ukraine. And that's even our, our next topic here. I think it's, I think it's pretty amazing how arrogant... 
uh, the Ukrainians can be Zelensky in yeah. particular. I mean, he, he doesn't think it. Uh, oh, he doesn't say please. I'll tell you no, that. He doesn't you say better please. do this, or there's this little war could last for a long time. But we promise it's going to be over, and you've got to get the weapons here. It's a it's a total total dependency, and it's a more likely a money issue. So you wanted to go on to talk a little bit about NATO Yeah, NATO, today? which the summit is tomorrow, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about it tomorrow, but here's a couple of tidbits and previews. We can actually put that next clip up um, about the, uh, uh, keep going, actually. Uh, keep going, sorry. <laughs> there we go. NATO to increase number of forces from 40,000 to more than 300,000. These are the rapid reaction forces. They only have 40,000 now, but Stoltenberg... <laughs> He must be on his knees thanking whoever he prays to because all of a sudden his organization has a purpose. We need to have thousands and thousands of more troops in Europe. You know, I, I read recently for popular uprisings to be successful, you don't need a lot of people. We've used that argument a lot that people get discouraged when they're trying to persuade others that you need 51 percent and that that's democracy and democracy <laughs> will rule. But uh, no, it's a small number of people that count. Leadership makes a big difference. And a lot of times people talk about philosophic leadership, but seven or eight percent can persuade a lot of other people, which is uh, you know fairly well known. But I came across an article now that said that when it comes to really changing a system that uh, it's more successful if you don't use violence. If you don't use a violent revolution, uh, you, you have twice the chance of being successful than if you use violence. So this is, uh, this is good news. But uh, I thought this was a great heading, uh, Daniel. NATO to massively increase high rate. Oh, well, we said that. No, the demonstrations yeah. I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Thousands demonstrate in Madrid. They're turning out ahead of the NATO. This is ahead of the NATO. Of course, the, uh, the meeting's in Madrid. So this, uh, I wouldn't have uh, suspected that this was going to happen. But, but I think this is, uh, this is very good news, and they, sh they should be encouraged. Uh, and, and if they want to be more successful than failure, do it peacefully and demonstrate it. And the, the article I read showed some of the examples in the world when uh, peaceful means were used, nonviolent uh, revolutions, and they can be very successful. But the problem is that sometimes when they're very nonviolent uh, and they're making success, the enemy who doesn't, that don't, that don't want it to work, they claim that there's violence, there's an insurrection yeah. going on. So you have to watch out on the, on the reports coming from the governments. And you're right, there are thousands of people demonstrating in advance of the Madrid summit. One of the signs says, neither Putin nor NATO, uh, and they want, uh, this is from the Al Jazeera article about it, demonstrators call for U.S.-led NATO to be dissolved and for military bases maintained by the U.S. and Spain to be closed. They said tanks, yes but full of beer, right? <laughs> they want tankers of beer uh, rather than this. So there, there is some uh, resistance among the population. There's going to be a lot more when the winter gets a little bit colder in Germany and they don't have anything to keep warm with. I think we have a picture of that protest, if we can put it up. Uh, we're skipping around here today a lot. We're going we're gonna to upset our friends in the back. Here we are, thousands demonstrated in Madrid ahead of NATO summit, but they're undeterred. <clears throat> in fact, if we can backtrack one, this is from Zero Hedge, and we're talking about escalation, Dr. Paul, U.S. readies longer range missile defense system for Ukraine as G7 hike sanctions. So even as we see from the New York Times that there's a real problem and the U.S. administration is trying to signal somehow that this isn't working well, the answer is never to say, you know, this is not working. Just like with Afghanistan, remember, for 20 years they said, we're just around the corner. We're almost there. We've almost got this thing won. Then we went home, and about three minutes later, it fell. So what they plan on doing is sending missiles now that can, that can have a 100-mile range. Um, right, the high Mars they sent have a 40-mile range. Now they're going to up it and more than double it. If those missiles start going into Russia from Ukraine, there's going to be a major escalation. In fact, there's a possibility of major escalations on many fronts here, including Kaliningrad, which we talked about the other day. But here you have the power, I think, Dr. Paul, of the military-industrial complex, where you see laid out in front of you a devastated nation destroyed by war now. And instead of saying, you know what, we need to figure out a way out of this, 
The answer is we need more high-priced weapons sent in there. You know, you can imagine Biden probably gave Putin a call on this, yeah, and yeah. he promised. He says we have no intention on using these things. So don't we, worry. We'll just put on. We'll put on more yeah. sanctions or yeah. do something else. It is. It is a sort of a joke. The the whole thing, but such a dangerous joke. So that that to me is is a real pity. It is, yeah. and I, I was going to mention something just in advance of the. Uh, this is the G7 summit. Um, and actually, I think you had something about the G7 that you were going to mention. But, um, but here's Johnson and Macron. Boris Johnson is probably, he makes uh, George W. Bush at his worst look like a, you know, like a, a softie. But let's put this next one up. This is from Politico. Boris Johnson called up Macron. He's actually hanging out with Macron. You know, they're arms around each other, good buds. Johnson warns Macron not to attempt Ukraine settlement now. He's literally saying, don't settle this. Keep them fighting. Keep them dying. And here's a tweet from Kyle uh, Anzalone, who's from the Libertarian Institute, uh, and he points it out as well. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said Russia's victory in Ukraine would have consequences for the world that are absolutely catastrophic. Johnson continues, Joe Biden is currently spending $46 billion to help Ukraine. I would argue that's a price worth paying for <laughs> democracy and freedom. So Boris Johnson thinks it's a good price that we have to we have to dole out forty six billion. Just a little change here. Pocket there. change. Now the uh, at the G seven meeting, I, I when I think of G seven, I usually think uh, NATO and some other yeah. organization that they're all the same people, but uh, and they like to spend money, but it usually it uh, deals with uh, you, you know the, uh, the the military stuff. But here, the G7 unveils a $600 billion global infrastructure. Oh, they're in infrastructure. Yeah. So they, they're they not totally controlled by the military industrial complex. And they maybe want to build highways or things. But, they, but what, what gets me this is this is so important. They have to counter uh, China. You know, China sells a lot of stuff to us, uh, and, uh, and and Americans get a pretty good deal. But we're taking care of that. We're putting on enough sanctions to make it difficult and pushing these prices up. But we, our goal now, our G7, which is the United States, the goal is to counter China's Belt and Road. And as a, that, of course, is, is sort of capitalistic when you think of, you know, really trade, international trade, where you can you tra uh, travel these roads. And of course, in, in an area where they've had a road there for a thousand years, probably, you know, so so they're going to get involved there. And uh, I guess the military people will have to argue, well, that's way too much for that. Uh, there's there's they could use it for military trucks or something. But uh, the, so it's, it's almost difficult. You talk about Ukraine. Uh, and a few other places, but there, there's always the the idea of a, a, a two-front war. And what are we yeah. going to do? Uh, are we going to antagonize enough that uh, uh, you, you know, if if Ukraine is a failure, will the Chinese at, at attack uh, you, you know Taiwan and and go in? And that's a whole different story too. Uh, who, who's right and who's wrong and what are we going to do and how many Americans uh, should, should die over this and, and that kind of nonsense. But uh, right now, they don't talk about small change. $600 billion here and uh, they, they, they just continue. To, they believe, it, it really goes back to my big concern is they believe that the monetary system has no limits. Yeah. All you have to have are guns and uh, then, then you can spend money and reserve currency and uh, be a wealthy country. Uh, but, you know, the, the attempt to uh, have guns and butter in the 60s turned out to be a fiasco for the 70s. And I think we're at the beginning of that uh, fiasco that, that is, demands a correction. And I, I, think, uh, I, I think the distortions from all this stuff that we've been talking about is much greater than the distortions uh, which were horrible uh, you know, with Vietnam. But I think this is, what's going on in the world today is, is a much bigger deal. Yeah, I, I'm afraid you're right, because you usually are, so I can't <laughs> disagree. But I'm going to close out. If we can put on that very last clip, I'm going to skip over that one. We'll deal with that some other time. But that very last clip, and I'm going to have some good news on Monday. I always need good news on Monday, if we can make that nice and big. Um, we announced on Thursday that we had just opened up ticket sales for our Washington, D.C. conference on September 3rd 
at the Westin Washington Dulles Airport. Very nice hotel. Well, Dr. Paul, I'm very happy to say, just, a, just over this weekend, uh, without a lot of fanfare, we've sold about a quarter of the available tickets. So we've already sold 25% of the tickets without announcing any speakers. One of the things that we've done, because we know everyone is, is hurting, is we put in an early bird special, save $10, buy it in the month of July. So get it now, get it quick. Um, if you go to the, there is a link in the description, I already put it in, that'll give you some more info on it and a clip of where you can buy the tickets. Um, <clears throat> I'll have something in the article later, but we are looking for gold and silver host committee members uh, who will join us for the different VIP events, and I'll give some details on that. But long and short of it, Dr. Paul, great response so far. And we worry. I mean, everyone's trying to make a buck go a little further. We understand that. But they also, it's important to get together, as you know, hear some great speakers and make you know, contact with like-minded people. So very, very good early indicators that we're going to have a great, great crowd as usual. Good. And you know, what we do here and with our conferences and all our reports deals with a bankruptcy that I have mentioned for many years. And uh, most people think of bankruptcy, uh, and most of the time I do mention, we're thinking about financial bankruptcy. How, you know, how individuals right now are going bankrupt because prices are going up, which was a predict predictable event. So uh, people are in trouble because there will be and continues to increase real bankruptcy. So far, the United States is not considered ba financially bankrupt because we still have uh, control of the high seas and we have most of the weapons and people still trust the dollar. But we, we are in the, in the middle of a financial bankruptcy because the market dictates that when there has to be a correction and uh, it always invites, uh, you know, you, you know the, the political uh, problems that come with it and, and all the disruption there. But the other thing that people don't talk as much about it, but I think, uh, you know, just as with this uh, uh, recent court rulings on uh, the uh, constitutional right to own a gun and also uh, the, the uh, Supreme Court uh, making this uh, sincere attempt to uh, do something about what, what's going on with, uh, uh, with the abortion issue and whether or not it's constitutional returns some of that responsibility to the states. But I think it's symbolic of the moral, uh, the, the moral bankruptcy as well. So when you look at wokeism and what's going on in our schools and just this genderism and, and uh, people who want to be on the Supreme Court, they don't even know what a woman is and yet we're promoting them. I mean, they're, they're, this has to be a reflection of some, some very, very serious uh, problems because uh, I, I think it is reflecting of, of 100 years of a downturn and uh, what we t have talked about, what freedom is and what liberty is all about, and uh, that, uh, that there is such a thing as a higher law. And when people say, well, you can't know right and wrong, and we're seeing a consequence. And I think, uh, I think there's a lot more people are very interested in and want to do something about the financial bankruptcy, but also the moral bankruptcy is very important and people will have an opportunity to think this through because this whole issue of how, what life is and when it's important and how you deal with it, uh, that is a major issue and it's going to be with us for a while. But these are all very important things. So if we want to live in a free society, which is my goal and the goal of most Americans, I think that we have to pay attention to this because if we want more peace and prosperity, we have to consider seriously the definition of what liberty really means. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.